Good morning. I'm James, one of the pastors here, and thank you for being here as we dig into God's Word a little more. The title of our series is called Unwavering, as we recount the story of some of God's people who are living in exile. These people lived in a little country at the time, was called Judah. Jerusalem was their capital city, and they had been invaded and overrun by Babylonia, and many of the people had been transported away in exile to live in Babylon, far from home. And the big question really facing them, and the big question we read about in the story is, could their faith be sustained in such difficult circumstances? Would they be unwavering in their commitment to their God? Last weekend, chapter, Pastor Kyle took us through chapter one of the book, and we read the story of people becoming enculturated and arriving in their new place. And we looked at some of the challenges of living in this place of exile, including isolation, being a long way away from your friends and family and your home and everything that felt familiar. Indoctrination, being forced to learn just not a new language or culture, but customs and beliefs and ways of doing things that you may not have felt comfortable with. And then came the, the sneaky part of gratification. If you do all the things we want, we'll give you good stuff. Just capitulate and fit right in. And lastly came the question of identification, where people were stripped not only of their language, but of their names and given new names, trying to eradicate their history, their story, and their identity. If you've not had an opportunity to listen, I'd encourage you to do so. You can watch the playback on Facebook or YouTube, or, and it would be worth your while, I think, to take the time to do that. Because it wasn't just a history lesson. It's actually the story of us right now. It's the story of people like us who live in our present reality of exile. You see, it wasn't just Daniel and his friends a few thousand years ago who found themselves there. It's exactly where we often find ourselves as the followers of Jesus. We've moved from the center to the margins of society. We've moved from the majority to the minority of the population. We've moved from being settlers, if you like, quite comfortable to becoming sojourners who don't really quite feel as much at home as we used to. We've moved from privilege to plurality in a world that's becoming diverse. We've moved perhaps from control to witness, where our job is to share our story rather than tell everybody what to do. And as a church, we've moved from maintenance to mission because God has given us a task where we live right now. But how do you live like that? How is that possible? It's what the book of Daniel is all about. It's how to live with faith in a faith-stretching world. It's how to love in a hostile environment. It's how to have a faith that is unwavering. The obvious answers, though, are not always the best answers. Sometimes we choose things like assimilation. Let's just go along to get along. We'll fit right in. Your values will become my values. Your culture will become my culture. Your way of thinking will become my way of thinking, whatever it takes. We don't look, act, or do anything differently to anybody else. Faith, if we have any, becomes very private, never to be talked about at school, never to be talked about at work, never to be talked about in politics, never to be mentioned in public, just something you do at home in private or possibly in a big room like this on a weekend service. Sometimes we choose separation and we become distinct in that sense, perhaps like the ancient monastics or like the Amish, keeping ourselves to ourselves, huddling, distant away from everybody, living in a church environment, having as little to do with anybody else in our world environment as possible. We end up building a wall of safety rather than a bridge of hospitality that would reach out and hope to those around us. Others choose confrontation. This is more like a culture wars approach. We're going to fight. And often we look back to an imaginary past that we think was so much better than it was, at least for those who were privileged enough. But in the end, the quest for power results in faith becoming the casualty. And we see that far too often. And to me, all of these options, they feel like we as the followers of Jesus have forgotten something. We've forgotten how to face hostility, turning the other cheek, like Jesus not only taught us, but did. We've become so enamored with power, we've forgotten the ministry of suffering that Paul wrote so eloquently about 
in his own journey and those of his missionary team who traveled with him. We've become so accustomed to wealth that we could not imagine poverty and utter dependence upon God to be our provider. We've forgotten that faith doesn't have to wither in adversity, but faith can thrive in exile. That might seem counterintuitive, but for Daniel and his friends, we discover their faith wasn't crushed in exile. It grew and expanded. Their circumstances were not a threat to them. They were an opportunity to display God's glory. They were unwavering. And today I'm going to read to you from Daniel chapter 2 as we pay attention to a faith that listens. Here's how this week's story begins. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed such dreams that his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. So the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had such a dream that my spirit is troubled by the desire to understand it. The Chaldeans said to the king, in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will reveal the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar, bad dreams. Last weekend, Kyle shortened his name to Neb because it's easier to say. It's certainly shorter to type when you're trying to do that if you're as bad as typing at me. And besides, who actually would call their kid Nebuchadnezzar? Anyway, it turns out it's not the first time he's had a bad dream. He uses the word plurally in the first verse. Neb is not having a good night's sleep. Night after night, he's having nightmares and it's been going on for a while. I mean, can you imagine being the ruler of this huge empire in his environment, king of the universe? but you can't even control your own sleeping pattern and you try to go to bed and you're awake half the night terrified with dreams that are taking place? Can you imagine how frustrating that could be when you can march anywhere and take anything you want, but you can't sleep? Back in those days, dreams were considered to have way more significance than we often attach to them. People believed that their dreams were messages from the gods. We usually think you're just eating far too much pizza at nighttime and now you can't sleep. Or you're troubled at work because you have a big project and you're thinking it through over and over and your mind is racing. Not them. They believed dreams really mattered. In fact, there was a whole profession of people whose job was to explain dreams and interpret them. They made good money out of this. It was like a trade guild of interpreters for dreams. There was no Google for them. But they did have libraries of what they would call dream books, where they began to write down different aspects of dreams, symbols that may have appeared in your dream, and what they might mean. I dreamt last night I was living in New York. I have no idea what that would say in a dream book, but there you go. Nor do I want to, in case you're wondering. <laughs> so all they were really saying to him was, look, Neb, King, sorry, if you tell us what it's all about, we can put it together with our dream book and tell you what it means. But first they needed him to explain what he had dreamt about. And so they say, O king, live forever, which is always a good approach to suck up to the guy who has absolute authority and can kill you if he feels like it. O king, live forever. And then they said, just give us the clue, give us the insight, what you can remember. We'll sort it all out. We'll get back to you ASAP. Did you notice also in verse 3 when they spoke to the king, it says that they responded in their own language, Aramaic. That was the language of commerce and of the empire. It was the language that Daniel and his friends had to learn so they could go to school and so they could go to work and so they could be part of Nebuchadnezzar's government. It's what they had to do. They had to figure out how to live in Babylon. And interestingly enough, when it says that they spoke in Aramaic, the actual book of Daniel changes language that it's written in. Right up until this point, it's been written in Hebrew. But the language changes. It's a very Semitic language, the same root. But it changes from Hebrew to Aramaic, and it will stay that way all the way through for a big chunk of what's going to happen in the book. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But for whatever reason, King Nebuchadnezzar is not very happy about their response. Maybe it's because he can't really recall his dream, so now he's in a quandary. What are they supposed to do? He can't recall the dream. They can't tell him what it meant if he doesn't give them a hint. Or perhaps he's come to the conclusion that these people are just charlatans who are making their money off powerful or perhaps even poor people trying to sell them these strange stories. Whatever it is, he's not happy. And he needs a way to figure it out. So he opts for a carrot and stick approach. The carrot you can see in verse 6 if you've got a Bible with you or you're using a mobile device. 
The carrot, we're told, is gifts and rewards and honor. There's a lot in this for you if you get it right, boys. But the stick, the stick in verse 5 is a terrible death by dismemberment and destruction of your property. There's a predicament. Without detailed information about the dream, there's no way they can tell the king anything. And if they don't tell him something, they're all going to die in very short order. So for a second time in verse 7, they request more information. Just give us what you've got, king. And this time, the king is tired of them. He's tired of them playing for time. And he offers not the carrot anymore, just the stick. Tell me or you're dead. And once again, they plead for information. The Chaldeans answer the king, there's no one on earth who can reveal what the king demands. In fact, no king, however great or powerful, has ever asked such a thing of a magician or an enchanter or a Chaldean. The thing that the king is asking is too difficult and no one can reveal it except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. They give up. Nobody can do what the king wants. It's impossible. But I want you to pay attention to their closing remark. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. Any of you remember watching a movie that came out in 2010, I think it was, called Inception? They're as bad as Saturday night. Honestly, you people need to get out and have a life and do something. (laughs) Really. Now you know what to watch this afternoon or this evening. It's about a technology that allowed you to enter into somebody else's dream and enter in through their dream into their subconscious and rummage around. And it was used for commercial espionage so that you could go in, find somebody else's secrets, your competitor, some other company, dig around, find out what they were doing and get ahead because you could figure out what they were up to. You could extract something from their subconscious thoughts while they were dreaming. It's a fascinating movie. It's worth watching. And I think King Nebuchadnezzar must have been a Leonardo DiCaprio fan because that's exactly what he's asking the magicians to do. Since he can't remember, you better get inside my head, figure out the dream was, and then tell me what it means. Except he can't. Nobody can do that. It's not real. The king is furious, and he issues a decree for all of them to be executed. It turns out that's going to include Daniel and his friends. And just imagine, last week as Kyle was teaching us in chapter 1, these guys all got a promotion from being prisoners of war to advisors, spiritual advisors to the king, standing beside him, telling him what's what. And now here in chapter 2, you discover the spiritual advisory department is being dismembered, literally cut apart. What would happen to their faith now? Somehow in verse 16, Daniel manages to get an audience with the king. And he too asks for a bit more time. The king calls him by his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. He will not address him as a foreigner, as a believer in the true God. He calls him Belteshazzar, which means lady protect the king. How demeaning. You can tell the king seems desperate though. The Babylonians couldn't do much to help him. Maybe these guys can. We're not told explicitly, but Daniel's request is granted and he gets a bit of time. He wins some time, so he heads home, and his friends are there. He meets with the three of them, and he addresses them by their Hebrew names because they trust in God. And he calls them Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they know that they have one recourse. There's only one way to go, to pray to their God, the God of heaven. The Babylonian sages were only half right when they said, nobody could do this for you, king. Only the gods, and they don't live around here, so we're in trouble. They were only half right when they said that. Because only God could answer the question. Only God could. But it turns out God is with his people. God is with his people. Even in Babylon. And so Daniel asked his friends to seek mercy from the God of heaven. Concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his companions may not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. The God of heaven. It's a phrase that will show up in Daniel chapter 2. Verse 18, verse 19, verse 37, verse 44. It's a reminder that while God's house might not be in Babylon, his temple, where in a sense people felt was his dwelling place, his temple was in Jerusalem. He may not live physically in that sort of sense, although it's a metaphor in Babylon, but he is with his people and always available to them and in contact with them. He isn't inaccessible. He's not hiding 
He isn't playing hide and seek with them. And he doesn't play hide and seek with you either. It's a reminder that he's present and longs to have a conversation with each one of us. But we need to learn how to listen. In fact, it's more than a reminder. This whole part of the story points way forward towards Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. Because Jesus is God's full and final revelation to us. The Bible promises us that we may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery that is in Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This revelation is available to us through the work of the Holy Spirit within us, who convicts us of its truth and then helps us to understand so that we can live in this counterintuitive, countercultural sort of way. A message that says things to us that in order to truly live, we need to die that we need to lose if we're going to gain, that we should rejoice in suffering rather than feeling sorry for ourselves, that we should pray for those who persecute us rather than try to kill them, that we would become a faithful, unwavering witness to the wonder of God and his presence in our lives and in our world. And during the night after they'd prayed, Daniel received a vision from God. And now he's ready for action. He knows what he's going to do. But first things first, And he begins to offer a praise, a prayer of praise to God, praising God for both his wisdom and his power. We read it beginning in verse 20 of chapter 2. Daniel said, Blessed be the name of God from age to age, for wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons, disposes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. To you, O God, of my ancestors, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and power, and have now revealed to me what we asked of you. For you have revealed to us what the king ordered. See what's going on here? As he gives praise, he reminds us, it is God who is in charge. It's God who sets up and deposes kings and rulers. It's God who can change the seasons. That can be hard to believe as we watch the events in Ukraine or Israel and Gaza. It's easy to despair. It's hard to believe. Is God really in charge of this? Patience and mystery and unwavering faith can be hard to live with. It's also God who reveals deep and, th- deep and hidden things, Daniel reminds us. The things that we cannot see. When darkness creeps in, God knows what's going on. And it's with him that we face the uncertainty of days ahead. We're not alone. Daniel's praise song reminds us that God answers prayers. Because God controls history and God reveals his purposes to his people. If you like, he's the God of the impossible. What the wise guys could not do, what Daniel himself could not do, God can and reveals his purposes and what's going on. He can reveal the dream and its meaning because God controls history and God reveals. He's the God of the impossible. Sarah and Abraham, if you remember the story in Genesis, the first book in the Bible, they're so old, they should have been sitting around or using a walker when they were going out for a stroll. But one day God promises that they're going to have a baby. Sarah laughed, not surprisingly. But God is the God of the impossible. And he said to them, is anything too wonderful for the Lord or too hard for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for God? Where the scholars of Babylon had come to the end of their abilities, Daniel's God was just beginning. He's just getting started. He could reveal the dream because he's the revealer of mysteries we see in verse 29. Do you believe it? Do you believe that that's your God? When life throws the curveball curveball, and the news is overwhelming, when despair sets in, When the fear of unsurmountable problems is tying your stomach in knots, do you believe that your God is the God of the impossible? Daniel did. 
And so he gets another audience with the king. But when they're talking together, Daniel takes his sweet time to get to the point. That's bravado of you, ask me. But he wants the king to look beyond human ability towards God himself, the God of heaven. Because this is not Daniel's smarts. This is what God has told him. In verse 27, Daniel answered the king, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or diviners can show to the king the mystery that the king is asking. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has disclosed to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen at the end of days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed were these. I could imagine Nebuchadnezzar getting a little excited. Somebody finally is going to tell me what's going on. Daniel had shown God, or God had shown Daniel both the dream and its meaning. The dream was of an enormous statue, this multi-layered masterpiece made of various metals. Gold was the head, silver was the torso, bronze was the midsection, iron legs, and then feet that were made out of a mixture of iron and clay or pottery. As you move from sort of the head and shoulders, knees and toes things, the metals decrease in value, but they actually increase in strength till you get to the ankles. And then you've got these feet made out of metal and pottery, a clay. And it's there they were most vulnerable. And it's at that point, this big rock shows up. This big stone comes rolling down. It bashes into the statue at its most vulnerable point, the feet. And the whole thing begins to crumble till it all turns to dust and is blown away in the breeze and there's nothing left. And then this big rock that was there, it becomes a huge mountain that eventually encompasses the whole earth. The space was all taken up by this gigantic mountain. And the statue was gone. Quite the dream. Then came the interpretation. Neb, he's the golden head put in place by God. I could just see him sitting there. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. You got to feel good about that. But change is coming. And everyone is replaceable, even the king. Kingdoms tumble and kings fall. Regimes, they come and they go. Eventually the stone, this big rock will replace them all. The exiles who are living in Babylon, God's people, they may have to deal with King Neb and all of his inhumanity and then deal with his metallic successors as they come along. But the rock is on its way. And that's God's promise to us too. We may live in a time and place that feels like exile. You may struggle with all sorts of things in your own personal life right now that make it seem as though God's far away from you and it seems so difficult and maybe the circumstances of your life are too much to bear. And maybe like me, you kind of quit watching the news after a while because it's too horrific and depressing. But here's the truth. The rock is on its way. Of course, there's some relief for the king. This wasn't going to happen, at least not anytime soon. It's all going to happen after him. There's no assassin waiting in his bedroom for him when he goes to rest that night. He could sleep easier. And to feed his own ego a little more, every successor would be a bit of a downgrade, not quite as golden as him. I guess that made him smile too. But one of the challenges for people like us reading this book so much later it's trying to make sense of these visions and dreams. And in the new year, we'll come to a whole section of the book that's filled with them. In this instance, we're often anxious to know, what do these parts of the statue actually mean? What are they representing? What's it all about? Daniel tells us that the gold head represents King Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon. As for the rest, there's actually a couple of theories if you're interested. One gets called the Roman theory. Gold is Babylon, we get that. Silver is the Medo-Persian Empire, bronze would be the Greek Empire, and the iron, the Roman Empire, and the toes would be the breakup and the fragmentation of the Roman Empire all the way to today. The other one's called a Greek theory, gold again, Babylon, silver the Medes, bronze the Persians, iron's the Greek, and then the toes are the Greek Empire that splits up after the death of Alexander the Great, essentially broke into two great parts, one led by the Ptolemies who focused their attention to Egypt, and the other by the Seleucids who focused their attention on Syria, which would also include Israel. That's what it might possibly mean. And it's fascinating stuff, except... We need to remember that Daniel is giving a theology lesson to the king, not a history lesson. It is the theology of history rather than a timeline for history that we see here. I need you to understand that. It is a theology of history, not a timeline for history. 
that Daniel offers to the king. The point of the dream is not figuring out what everything in the statue means. The point of the dream is paying attention to the stone. Verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall his kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain, not by hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has informed the king of what shall be hereafter. The dream is certain, and its interpretation trustworthy. The stone, we are told very clearly in verse 44, is the kingdom of God. It is a kingdom that comes from outside it isn't just the next in a series of human empires that we've all lived for for thousands of years. This is something else. It's what Jesus meant in John 18, 36 when he said, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, said Jesus, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Jesus is not simply saying, well, mine's a spiritual kingdom, so none of this stuff really matters that's going on round about. Mine's kind of invisible and very different. That's not what he's saying. He's not trying to say, I'm not very political. Leave that stuff alone. Let's just sing some songs. He's saying that the origin of his kingdom is not from human power, but from God's power. But this kingdom will be established on earth. It will replace the other kingdoms, but it will not destroy the world. It will not destroy God's creation. This is a creation being renewed and restored by its rightful owner, God himself. And because God is at work, his kingdom is indestructible and will last forever. The rock is on its way. In verse 35, we read that the stone struck the statue and became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. God's kingdom grows and spreads until it encompasses everything. There's lots of stone images in the Bible that can help us set the scene and figure out what's going on here. For instance, in Psalm 118, you could read this, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus used those words. Luke chapter 20, he's telling the story of these tenants that a farmer had let use his property and they were kind of ripping him off and doing bad things. And when anybody came to collect the money, they'd beat them up and send them on. Eventually, the owner sent his son to go and talk to them and they just killed him. It was a picture of Jesus himself. But Jesus used this cornerstone image right there in that story, saying something about himself and who he is. Or in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes this, Come to him, Jesus he means, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourself be built into his spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in Scripture. See, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus is that stone, that rock, inaugurating the kingdom of God. Jesus, the kingdom of God coming together, the rock is coming. Daniel has been given an inkling into what will come. Who will come? Jesus, he's the stone. And yet few notice. Is it any wonder that way back when, when a very lowly couple, Mary and Joseph, with nowhere to stay, Welcome a little baby that nobody else cared about into this world. They were slow to see the kingdom of God arriving because they wanted a Caesar smashing Messiah. They wanted a Herod halting warrior and that's not what they got. What they saw instead was an itinerant teacher with a group of mostly failed apprentices wandering around the countryside with them with nowhere to stay and not a bean to their names. They heard stories about the kingdom of God, but instead of crushing statues and filling the whole earth, this kingdom seemed a little bit more like an itty-bitty mustard seed or like some invisible yeast in a loaf of bread. Apparently, this kingdom was going to work differently, they, they thought, but grow it would. The little seed would become a huge tree. The little pinch of yeast would make a huge loaf and grow it will. 
God's kingdom did burst into history with the birth and arrival of Jesus. And by his death and resurrection, he destroyed the power of the reigning prince, shattered and sent to dust. And before he returned to his father in heaven, Jesus announced to his disciples that all authority was his. His rule as king of the universe is underway. But this earth filling growth of the kingdom of God is a painfully slow process that we are part of until Jesus comes again to finally set all things right. When Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers would fit into one room. I mean, we wouldn't need a room like this. Into a tiny room. That's all there was. No army, no fortress, no weapons, just a handful of people. And yet 2,000 years later, the largest movement in human history, we gather as God's people. His kingdom continues to grow because the rock is on its way. The kingdom is already here, but not fully realized. Jesus says in Mark 1, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It's an invitation to join Jesus. It's an invitation to be part of what Jesus is doing. Even when we don't fully understand to say, I choose to commit my life to you. I surrender all that I have to you. And the things that I know, or I think I know that I've done wrong, I confess and repent of. And the stuff I don't know, tell me about so I can do something about it. And come and change my life. And Jesus is inviting them. Repent. Believe the good news. But the kingdom is here, but not fully. That's hard to grasp. It was for Jesus, friends. And so they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? It's here, but not fully. And Jesus had no intention of satisfying their curiosity about what would happen when, when he would return, or when the kingdom would be seen in all of its fullness. His response was, it's not for you to know the time or seasons that the Father is set by his own authority. But what Jesus does do is send them on a mission, our mission, when he says to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And just like the stone in Daniel 2 that filled the whole earth, our mission as God's people is that God's kingdom would be expansive to the whole earth. But it's a mission that requires listening. Just like Daniel, we need to learn to listen to the world we live in and to hear the whisper of need around us. Daniel was listening beyond the king's request about a dream. He was listening to the king's troubled heart. Would he survive? Would his power be secure? Who wanted him gone so that they could take charge? Was anybody going to reassure him that tomorrow would come and it would be okay? Is there a God? Turns out even kings and rulers feel fragile. And Daniel listened to him. We may not live in Babylon, but we do live in exile. But can you hear the needs around you? Can you hear the cry of the least and the lonely and the lost and the broken that you meet every day? Will you listen to the brokenness of our city and of our world? And maybe of the person that you share a home with? Or will we, like in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan, be like those dudes who just walked on by, barely glanced, and just walked away? Do you listen? to the whisper of the need around you? Are we listening to God for his word that speaks into our hearts, to our friends and family, to our city and to our world? Like Daniel, can we choose to listen before we speak? You see, listening beyond to God takes us way beyond human abilities as we attend to the one who is Lord over all, who is the revealer of mysteries and who can give us a word for the present moment if we listen, Daniel listened to the king and he listened to God and God had things to tell Daniel. And so Daniel listened and listening enabled him to answer the king and speak into the difficult situation. You ever find yourself in a difficult situation? Maybe like King Nebuchadnezzar, you've come to the end of your abilities because there are just things you cannot control. Try as you may, you're stuck. You don't know what else to do. You try to listen, but it's hard to hear. 
I want to remind you of the phrase we read earlier. There is a, there is a God in heaven. Could that reality change how you see your situation today? Maybe you've tried to make a particular relationship work and it just hasn't. You've tried to fix what was broken, but you've failed and you're not sure what else you could do. It feels that you've got no hope, except there is good news. There's a God in heaven. He's the God of the impossible. And the rock is on its way. You've prayed for your kids. You've loved them. You've done everything you could to help them turn out right. You gave it your best. Somehow... They made choices you never would and you don't know what else you can do. You feel at the end of your rope, you're stuck and there's nobody seeming able to help you. But there is a God in heaven and he's the God of the impossible and the rock is on its way. You've tried to overcome an addiction. You've tried to find that missing piece in your heart and the pain is all too real and every time you try, you try and you try and you fail and you try and you fail and think, what's the point? But there is a God in heaven who is the God of the impossible and the rock is on its way. And death and disease seem so very final. And in this year, they've taken things from you. They've taken from you people you love. They've taken from you your own health and strength. And you wonder, what's the point? Won't death take us all in the end? And the answer is yes, except there is a God in heaven who is the God of the impossible. And the rock is on his way. You're disappointed in our politicians and dismayed by our leaders. Newsflash, if you were in charge, we'd be disappointed in you too. But there is a God in heaven. He's the God of the impossible and the rock is on its way. And talking of disappointments, let me ask you, I doubt there is anybody disappointed you more than you've disappointed yourself because that's my story. No one has lied to you, let you down or broken a promise to you any more than you have to yourself. That's me. How much confidence do we really have to go forward to a better future? (laughs) But there is a God in heaven who's the God of the impossible, and the rock is coming. Do you recall I mentioned at the start of chapter 2, they changed the language from Hebrew to Aramaic? It goes back to Hebrew again in chapter 8. We'll get there. But it's as though all through these stories that you see God surrounding his people in Babylon. They're a long way away. They're in a lot of trouble, but he's with them. And even in the very structure and language the book is written, it's bracketed in. They may be in Babylon all trying to figure out Aramaic and life there, but the reality is the God who spoke to them in Hebrew has surrounded them, even in the writing of the book. They're never alone because there is a God in heaven and he's the God of the impossible and the rock is on its way. God is with his people wherever they are, even in exile. He is unwavering. And because he is unwavering, our faith in him can be unwavering. Are you listening? Are you listening? Because he's calling. <laughs>